me on? Oh, great. We got audio. So uh, normally in a space like this, I would just speak without one, but we have audio for our online folks. So and we're going to capture this. These are all actually put online, these uh, quarter mayor's uh, quarterly updates. Uh, so you can go back and see what I think are kind of the important salient things quarter by quarter over the last couple of years. So uh, welcome. So for those of you out there in TV land, I'm glad you're here. Thank you so much. Uh, we have several folks here and we'll have some time for Q&A at the end. Um, I do understand that there are a few folks that might have to step out if, if we go a little long because they've got a, 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 uh, another event, uh, boards and commissions. So I want to thank you guys for spending some time here tonight with us. But let's go ahead and get started with the quarterly update. And we'll talk about what's been going on or what I think are, are some of the kind of fun or important pieces that... Uh, need to kind of get a little more emphasis because we're all really busy. So tonight's agenda, we're going to talk a little bit about our Youth Action Council and Citizens University programs, uh, our parks program, and a recent award that we received called the Clyde Award, uh, city transparency and metrics. So this is really not anything new, but I thought it was important to kind of bring it back up because we forget there is so much information out there that sometimes we forget how we can go about getting information or staying informed. Uh, I'm going to introduce our new city secretary who actually is here in the room tonight. Um, didn't, don't know if he knew he was part of the agenda, but here he is. Um, so excited to be introducing him to uh, the community. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about Fighting Farmers Way. So as this is something that's going to be happening here on Main Street. Um, and then finally, since the state legislature is sort of done for the year, sort of, uh, they still have uh, a few more special sessions, I believe. Uh, but we're going to talk about what has happened up till now um, that directly impacts uh, Louisville and specifically Louisville government um, so we're that's going to be tonight's agenda but again at the end we'll have some time a little bit of time for q a be more than happy to, to answer questions that are on topic or, or maybe something that's a little bit off topic however however it works for us um, so first up, let's talk about Youth Action Council and Citizens University. So our Youth Action Council, it, this is an amazing program, by the way, and Council Member Brandon Jones actually is the one that kind of pushed this through to make it make it happen. He kind of started the seeds of it. Um, so our Youth Action Council is actually focused on high school age uh, students. Now, they can be homeschooled. They can be at the, the local high schools. They, they just have to be Louisville residents. Um, so if they're in that age range, that's great. Um, we have those folks and they actually go through training all these all these I hate to call them kids because they're young adults at this point uh, and they've got great ideas great input um, and this youth action council is actually designed to pull information from them how do we make things more engaging for the youth in our community how do we provide better services where are things that we might improve and so having that other lens to look at how we provide services to to our community i think is really important and they come up with great ideas um, so they actually advise the council on youth related issues. Uh, they create some special projects and events for the city, so those have been fun. Uh, of course, they, they learn about all the different departments and how the city operates, so they have a good foundation on uh, how, how most municipalities operate, but specifically Louisville. And most importantly, if you have a high school age student in that sophomore, junior, senior age range, um, applications for Youth Action Council are available now. Uh, all you need to do is go onto the city website, um, cityoflouisville.com. Up in the top, there's a search bar and just put in Youth Action or Youth Council and you'll find that information. You can probably even type in YAC um, to find that information. But, Make sure that their applications are open now. It's a fairly small window of time for, for those applications, so you want to get that done um, in the next week uh, if you can. So it's, it's a great program, and love to have, you know, if you've got one of those, those age kids or you know somebody in the neighborhood um, that's got a, a student that maybe is, is interested in um, public policy and, and how things operate, that, that'd probably be a great, great fit for them. The other adult version of this is Citizens University. Um, and Citizens University is a bit longer uh, in time and, and material, but basically you get to go through every department within the city. And what I, what I like to compare the city to is, you think about the city as, as a, a single entity with 
you know, roughly 16 multi-million dollar businesses within it, whether that's the water department, the streets department, the parks department, the libraries, the police, the fire, but you get to learn about every single one of them in Citizens University. Um, so I would absolutely highly recommend um, uh, that you attend. If you have an interest in maybe being involved in um, local government, this is a great foundation to understand what the city does and doesn't do and kind of give you an idea of what the scope is of uh, being an elected official within the city. In fact, uh, many of our boards and commission members, many of our city council um, have actually participated in Citizens University. So uh, it's a great time. Um, I've got some CU grads in here. Was it a great time? So there you go. Um, that was so that's that one the applications for that they're technically you can apply for them now um, but the application page on the city website is going to get fired up here in the next couple of weeks um, and it starts in September just uh, to give you a heads up on that one so Citizens University and Youth Action Council similar information but different age groups and different focuses now one of the things that I see that comes up about this time of year, um, because we start talking about um, fall elections and we start talking about the state government and how things happen that maybe it's hard to get uh, your elected official, hard to talk to them, hard to get your ideas across. What I, what I wanted to remind people of is that Louisville has an incredibly strong transparency focus. Um, and you know, quite frankly, I started in local government not as an elected official, not as a board member, but by going to city meetings and live blogging. Back when blogging was a thing. We didn't have video back then, right? So I would sit in a council meeting and I would type up everything that was going on. Because the agenda, you know, the agenda while it's 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 informative, it's not as deep as it is today or it wasn't then. You know, you didn't have hyperlinks where you could put the whole every packet up there. You had to go find the packet and big thick chunk of paper. Um, but today, of course, we have those tools. But I would sit there, I'd type for you know the however much time it took to type up, and then I'd post it to the internet. And I'm sure all of like four people read it. Um, and three of them were my family because I showed it to them. Um, so the, the key here, though, was that it was getting more information out to residents, it, to those who wanted to find out how discussions, how conversations, how decisions were made. This was a way to do it back in, in the day. Um, over time, however, because I kind of had that mindset and council had that mindset, over time, over the years, we've added a lot more to the transparency of the city. And quite frankly, one of our missions is to be data driven. So when we make decisions with our taxpayers dollars, with my dollars and your dollars, when we make those decisions, we make them based on data, on information. It's not just because we feel like it. Uh, we want to be able to back those decisions up and make sure that they're right for the community. So we do that with data. And since there is that much data there for us, that data should be available to citizens as well. And so when you hop onto our website, you're going to see a whole bunch of great metrics. Now, sometimes those links will break. And if there's information there that you want, you might have to reach out to city staff. So uh, because the software systems that we use, they have we have dozens of software systems and they all have to talk to each other. And I'm in IT, so I will tell you, Technology doesn't talk to technology all the time. That's not the default. Um, so sometimes we have to work through that. But if you're interested in finding out more about you know, how the metrics, and, and these metrics, by the way, the ones that you're seeing, we think are the metrics, not only are they relevant to residents, but they're relevant to staff. Um, they, those metrics tie into how our staff do their jobs. Um, so you, know, you can measure everything. Uh, the problem is, is that some measurements don't mean anything. So how do we find a measurement that is meaningful to both residents and staff? So if you're interested in finding out more and taking a look at our digital dashboard, you can go to metrics.cityoflewisville.com. And up there, you're going to see uh, three categories. You're going to see citywide metrics on the base page. And then you're going to have two other categories, finance and police, um, just because not only um, is finance you know, really big, lots of numbers, lots of spreadsheets, but police have to collect a lot of data, um, both federal and state requirements. So that, and that data has to be public. So that's why we break those out into their own separate systems. But when you take a look at the performance dashboard per se, um, you're gonna see our police and fire and EMS response times, really key, important, uh, you know, how, how are we doing? 
uh, Parks and Recreation, you're going to see their goals and overview of some of the tools that they're using. Uh, neighborhood maintenance. So if you're interested in code violations, rental violations, street and sidewalk repair, you know, those types of, of information. You can see kind of I took a, a clip here, talks about open and closed uh, violations within code enforcement. This, these are also the tickets that you might use if you use the our Louisville app. So if you use that app to submit stuff, it's you're actually going to see the results of that through this dashboard. Um, we've got a new development report. So if you're interested in, hey, what's that thing being built over there? Um, not all of that goes through city council. The only time typically that development comes up through your city council is if somebody needs something that's not the standard. If they want to change something or ver create a variance, then that's when it starts moving through the process. But if you know if that ground is zoned for a particular type of use and they have that type of use and they don't want to, you know, put up extra neon signs or any of that stuff, they just want to conform to what we do, what we've asked. Probably won't even see the city. So sometimes when people ask me, "Hey, what's going on in the corner or what and what?" I'm like. Great question. So I come to this page because the development report has that information. Um, and then, of course, capital improvement projects. So if we've got any large projects that are going on, there's a there's usually information there where you can find out how we're doing on on those projects. So those are usually the big budget items, sometimes the bond bond dollars, those types of things. So that's the performance dashboard. Now, on the finance side, of course, the budget is on there. And I think the budget is really important because it gives you, you know, our, our historical data of both property and sales tax. It's all open source data. So if you're a data cruncher, you can pull our information down and you can slice it and dice it however you want in your software. If you're a SQL guy, you're going to love this. Uh, spreadsheets galore. Um, we have our, our city check register is on there, so you can see checks that are written um, to the city. Again, financial transparency that's required by the state. Um, we have our financial health reports that come up, um, so we get an, an annual update on how we're doing, and that one is a, it's a great document. Actually, that's probably one of the more useful documents to me is just to see, you know, it's, it's a heartbeat on how we're doing. Um, bond elections. So, if you want to see how we've done on pa past bond elections, what have we? What has the city spent money on? Um, what's completed? What's not? You can find that information there. And then my favorite tool on this is the property tax calculator because what it does is you can put the value, um, uh, your your salary, and it's anonymous, but you can put your salary in there. If you own a property, you can put your property value in there from from the CAD, and then it will tell you how much of your dollars. First of all, our city taxes. So how much of that turns into city taxes and then proportionally how much of that goes to each department or section of the city, which is really neat. So you can see that, you know, the average resident in Louisville is paying just over five hundred dollars a year for police services. And that's actually one of our more expensive line items. You're paying less than two dollars and seventy cents a year for all of the things that city council does. So though you get that level of granularity can be shown up and I think it's a fun way to see the actual impact and even more importantly at the very bottom of this page and you can actually see it um, the property tax calculator I gave you a sample I actually put some of some of my numbers in there but at the very bottom they've got a, a tax advisor program where you can actually click on there and it takes you through an exercise on how would you allocate uh, tax dollars to the city so you can see you know what what your priorities are versus what the city typically has as priorities and see how they line up. It's really neat. And you can also download that and send it to your city council and say, I think we should be spending money in, in these proportions instead of some other way. So it's a neat tool. It's great for summertime. Uh, there's, you know, sit by the pool on your laptop. Check this out. It's awesome. As you can tell, I love data. Um, now, the third section, of course, is our, our police department transparency. And these most of these records are required by state and federal law. But again, transparency is key. We want to make sure that everybody knows how, our, how great our police department is, what they're doing, what they got to improve on, you know, like anybody else. Uh, these are benchmarking documents that we can use. So you've got racial profiling reports. You've got use of force reports. You've got crime statistics. You've got the general and procedural orders. Though, that's an important one, because that's how th those are the rules uh, how we go about doing our policing within our community. Um, and every community has different rules and structure on how they do that. There's a lot of similarity, but 
you know, rural rural municipalities have different needs than a, an urban municipality, a city versus a suburb. Uh, so those general and procedural orders might change a little bit depending. So it's important to kind of go in there and see. Um, and of course, uh, response to resistance or incidents. So those are use of force kinds of things. So uh, again, clarity and transparency is key. Um, I think the way you build trust in, in your municipality and your police and fire is by being very clear and open about how we do what we do. So um, again, wanted to remind folks of this. This has been on the city website for many years now. Um, I remember when it wasn't, and it's it's always exciting when we see new tools come up and, and actually one of our um, uh, city directors, assistant city manager, um, who runs this process, uh, ran this process to, you know, she, she's, she's amazing, she's our data queen. So that's what we have on data and transparency. Next up, just wanted to give folks a quick update on uh, parks because that seems to be, uh, a, we've got a lot of, lot of goings on in our parks department. They've been winning lots of awards. They've been doing some really great things. We actually uh, gave a life-saving award to two of our parks crew folks for uh, saving a young, uh, young child that was looking to be drowning. Um, and they, they caught him and got him up out of the water. So, um, you know, that's, that's how our team works. But uh, this month happens to be Parks and Recreation Month. And our big move right now is our Glory La Gloria Park, which is in progress. It's down on 35 and Southwest Parkway. Uh, as you can see, this picture actually shows some of the groundwork that's going on right now. That's only maybe a week old, that photograph, maybe two weeks. Uh, but you can see there's a lot of landscaping. Um, when you look, you can actually see the way that land moves. It actually puts a buffer up against I-35. So once we put in all the landscaping and trees and everything, it's, it's going to be a beautiful green space. Uh, one of the important drivers to this is this program we have, which is called a 10-minute walk to a park. We believe that every resident of Louisville should have access to green space within a 10-minute walk. It should be safe, should be e easy to get to, and so we're trying to get there. Now, when we first looked at this metric back in 2017, we were looking at only about 61% of the city. Fair, but could be better. Um, we're, we're kind of on the low end for cities our size. Um, by setting that stake in the ground, uh, we started doing collaborative work with the school district. We started working on ways to link parks that didn't have good uh, sidewalk infrastructure, those types of things. And so by 2023, we've been able to take that to 77%. And by the time Glory Park is completed, which I believe is the end of this year-ish, so yeah, yeah, numbers, dates kind of just depends on how, how all of the tools end up working in the toolkit. But once we get uh, Glory Park in alignment, we're gonna be at 80, 81% of the city. So that, that is, uh, you know, 3% of our city population being handled uh, right there with one park. So I'm really proud of the city council, city staff, residents who identified this as a need and, and really drove this project. So it's gonna be an amazing space. We, we hope that it'll have places for a community market, uh, spaces for food trucks. So it's gonna be a really kind of a hub, a social hub and, a, and an environment that people can come out to. They, they're being excited. So we're looking for other opportunities because we still got 20% of the city to cover um, by 2035. So we're looking at 12 years. That's it's a, lot of t it's a lot of time. It feels like but to find infrastructure like this you know some parts of our city built out really densely and they don't have acreage so we got to figure out how to put a park in a space right now that doesn't have one and, and really is built out so that's some of the creativity we've got to come up with one of the great things about um, that staff though is that uh, because we have such good programming and such good policies we actually created a healthy infrastructure plan um, and approved it this past year this is a roadmap for the next 10 20 years uh, the state requires it by the way so that we can get grants um, if we're not doing these types of projects and planning then when we apply for a grant they're gonna go well you're just winging it you know, and the goal is that we're not winging it, we're trying to get from point A to point B. Um, so this Clyde Award that we got here last month, or earlier this month actually, uh, was our healthy infrastructure plan for our Parks Master Plan. Um, it really, what's neat about this one, usually they talk about a building 
but this was talking about a policy and plan structure. And what's important to know about that is that, that indicates, because this is picked by other municipalities in North Texas, this shows that we're being a leader in this space and that other cities can actually use components of our plan. You know, every community is different, but our plan is a benchmark now that other cities need to be and should be and are looking towards on how to develop their parks and green space. So we're really excited, really pleased with our parks department. So I'm, I'm waving that flag this month. So I appreciate y'all. Our parks director is back at the back of the room. That's, and so I'm just, I'm, I'm fact checking. I'm, I'm so far I'm, I'm, I'm in good shape. So that's good. All right. So next up, um, we have four city officials that we hire as city council. When I say we, it's the city council. Um, those are hired directly by city council. Everybody else that is an employee of the city is hired underneath the city manager and all the department heads, uh, assistant city managers. It's all, all through that. They, they, we don't talk to them. That's not our job. Our job is strategy. And the four key people that help us with our strategy are, of course, our city attorney, our city judge, our city manager and our city secretary. I did those in alphabetical order, so I didn't want to just, there, there is no ranking there, it's alphabetical order. <laughs> but uh, I do want to introduce Mr. Thomas H. Harris III. He actually happens to be standing at the back of the room tonight, um, but he has uh, 15 years of municipal government experience. He's from Sugarland, Texas. And I think one of the key attributes that he brings to the table is that he has a track record of strong leadership, but more importantly, understands a lot of the digital tools um, the city secretary, not there. Okay, the name is a misnomer. Okay, secretary is not what this job is when people think of secretary. While they do manage calendars and they do manage, you know, filing and records, uh, their job is to make sure that we are compliant with state law. They spend a tremendous amount of time making sure that we are following the rules, um, whether that's keeping documents, disposing of documents, whether that's making sure that council members are, you know, where they need to be, when they need to be there, and not too many of them because you can't have a walking quorum. Um, all of those things, managing all those personalities, uh, the city secretary's office is really a huge communicator between city council, city staff, and residents. Because that is the first place that people are going to go when they have a question, is where's the city secretary? How do I, how do, I do this? Um, so think of them as, as a librarian for the city, if you want to think of it that way, since we're here in the library today. Um, but we're really excited to have Thomas on board. Um, first place I took him was to uh, Jackie's Ham and Eggs, because if you're going to come to Louisville and have breakfast, you got to have a huge pancake or, or um, uh, biscuit for breakfast. So Thomas is fitting really, really well in. And if you ever have questions of the city, he's probably, he and his staff are probably the ones you're going to be dealing with. Now, the next one up, I've seen a little chatter on this on, on social media. So I wanted to talk a little bit about it, but I also kind of wanted to clear it up um, for folks. Um, back when we had to, to take down the water tower, part of that conversation was that we needed to replace it with something that did two things. Okay. The first thing it had to show our history and our, our pride in our 125 plus years fighting farmers. Um, you know, our town, our town is probably the biggest small town you're going to find. Uh, and that had a lot of history attached to it. And we wanted to make sure that we represented that well. And we wanted to also re make sure that everybody on I-35 knew that we were proud of our fighting farmers. And so we had a process and we went with TxDOT and TxDOT is redoing I-35. You guys probably are starting to see some of the work, um, but they're doing the next part, which is corporate 121 um, and Main Street. Those, those three intersections are going to be completely redone. Um, on the Main Street one, we had a process and you can get the base standard, like here's a concrete wall for the underpass, enjoy. Um, or you can do an upgrade. Um, so for an example, when you go to 407, we've got all the fish and it shows the lake and it's, it's really a, it's a nice upgrade, doesn't just look like a concrete wall. Um, so Main Street, we worked with them to do the upgrade and on these cement panel, panels, which they're, they're, um, they, they've flown around social media, I didn't put them on here today, I probably should have, but um, those panels had a marching band, they have a silhouette of the, of the water tower, um, you know, they have things that are representative of Louisville and our fighting farmers. And the design originally had the words fighting farmers. Well, that was great. TxDOT signed off on it. We're good to go. Not a problem. And then a couple months back, TxDOT said, well, we've changed the policy. 
So I don't know what somebody wanted to put on a wall somewhere in Texas, but they obviously ruined it for the rest of us. And so they told us we, had, we could keep all the graphics, but we had to remove the fighting farmer's words. Um, so I'm driving down to Austin because I got to go down there for some various and sundry things this spring, and I'm seeing all these bridges with the names of the street painted on the bridge. And I'm like, I can solve this problem because we, we've got to let people know these are fighting farmers. And so council agreed. We decided to rename the bridge Fighting Farmers Way. Uh, and so now, instead of having two concrete panels that said Fighting Farmers, the TxDOT will be placing the words Fighting Farmers Way on both the north and south sides of the bridge, so you can see it as you're driving underneath. And they will be placing it on all of the exit signs um, for as you drive up, you know, it says two and a half miles, one and a half miles. So it'll say Fighting Farmer Way, Main Street, um, on two, two signs on the southbound side and two signs on the northbound side. They could have done two, they got eight. So I'm happy, uh, council's happy, I think our, our LHS Fighting Farmers are happy. We're really excited to see that process. But that's what's going on and that's what we did. Of course, it's gonna be another 18 months or, or longer again construction projects being what they are. Um, but that's what you're gonna be seeing. And then on Main Street, we're looking to redo the graphics on the Main Street signs where they show the LHS and, and they have the, the LHS colors. So you can see that. Because that's, that's a sample that may or may not be the end product. Now, finally, um, I do have a couple of slides really on uh, state legislation, just so you can have a, an idea here. So th there were four bills that I really wanted to spend a little bit of time on. Uh, the first was House Bill 3579. So you may have heard a lot of talk about Austin removing cities' abilities to, to legislate or, or rule build. Um, I'm gonna talk to that a little bit uh, in the second one. Um, we wanted to improve our police department's ability to go after massage parlors that are, that are doing illicit work, okay? The current process is really long and convoluted and it has to, it's really hinged upon an indictment or, or a, not a conviction. And so what happens is somebody gets arrested, we go through the legal process, it takes 18 months, two years, whatever that is. Meanwhile, there's still an operator going on because we, we couldn't close the business. Or maybe we can get the, the state of Texas um, licensing bureau to come up and close the business, but that's again another long process because they've only got a half a dozen folks to cover the entire state. So our police department, we all sat down. I worked with Senator Parker. I worked with uh, Representative uh, Temish. Uh, council got on board. Everybody was excited about this process where we basically, it's, it's kind of a three strikes and you're out. If we have three events that happen, we uh, arrests, we can shut you down. Now, that passed. Long and winding road. I want to thank Cronda uh, Temish, Ben Bumgardner, Tan Parker, Senator King, um, who's not one of our uh, state senators for the Louisville area, but he was one of the signatories to create the bill. Um, we got that. We got that law passed. Long and convoluted. Um, here's the problem, though. It was a law that gave cities more power, and Austin sees that in a very black and white way. Cities shouldn't have power or they should. And so it's really, really was an odd kind of place where we were. So we knew that this House Bill 2127 was gonna pass. Uh, some people have called it the Death Star Bill. It's called the Preemption Bill. And basically what it does is it says, hey, if you get outside your lanes in the, um, uh, the, con the state constitution, we, you can't do it anymore. Used to be that you know a city could write an ordinance and if the state didn't like it, the state could cancel it. So there was a drilling ordinance a few years ago that was probably the most most uh, up to date one that I can remember, where uh, some of the cities tried to tried to have more restrictions on drilling than the state really wanted them to. So they said, nope, you've got to live with the, the state rules. So that was you know one offs. Now it's like if you want to make an exception or you want to do this rule, you're going to have to go get it passed at the state level. So that's, that's frustrating for a lot of cities. Uh, thankfully, Louisville doesn't have a lot of impact at the moment that we're aware of. We're still reviewing our, our, our legislation, our ordinances to see what the impacts are gonna be. Um, but in general, we think it's okay. Um, bigger cities have more, more challenges with this. Um, but we knew if this preemption bill passed, it would short circuit our ability to enforce 
the, uh, the massage parlor bill. And so we actually got an exemption written into House Bill 2127 so that we would have that pass and it would be acceptable by the state to have that power. Um, so lots of work to make this all happen, but um, that's, that's where we are. Um, the next one on this list is House Bill 3287. So for those of you who don't know, we have this pro, uh, a tool, basically, the state does. It's called Texas State Technical College. Some of you may have heard about TSTC. TSTC is, for those who haven't, it's a, it does certifications. So welding, um, heavy machining, you know, stuff that takes big labs and expensive work. Um, uh, electrical linemen, those types of things. So those business, those uh, career certifications that are expensive, it's not just a computer lab, right? Um, this is what TSTC does. Um, they are funded by the state and they're funded based on job placement. So these folks have to get good paying jobs for TSTC to actually get paid. So it's, it's a really cool, innovative process and it doesn't rely on a county tax, like a community college tax to be funded. Well. TSTC has economists that go out and they look throughout the state and they're looking for job skills gaps where the education system is not providing enough of the toolkits that are needed by businesses to produce the products and services that we all know and love. Uh, and when TSTC does that and they find a gap, they can't just go to that county. The state has to approve them. And so this year they approved, they found a gap in Denton County and they approved it for Denton County. So I was down there several times. Um, quite, let, I'll be, I'll be real blunt here. I would love to see a Texas State Technical College campus in Louisville, Texas. I think it would be an amazing resource for our families for upskilling, for getting them trained, for job security. Uh, we we don't have a higher education space here in Louisville today, so that to me would be awesome. It would collaborate and work great for those of us who maybe know about our ISD. We have an amazing Tech East and Tech West program. Those are again for certifications. But once you get out of high school, you can't get back into those those buildings, you, into those resources. Um, so we have a great program for our kids. We don't have as good a options for our parents and our families that need those extra tools. So to me, this this is going to be really interesting because uh, we've got to work with the county. Um, we got to work uh, to get funding, location, all of that stuff. But we're starting to have conversations about it. But I'm really proud of the work that uh, Louisville did, myself and my, uh, my city council, my city staff, um, and all the support to, uh, to actually get this to happen. Because you had to go down there and argue for it because Austin Austin doesn't spend money, so they, they, you, you have to argue to get that expansion, so that's what we did. And then the final one, um, you won't see right away, or maybe you will, um, uh, if you use hotels in Denton County, uh, there is a 2% uh, hotel occupancy tax, so an additional 2% is going to be added to the bills of hotels um, throughout the county um, that will help fund a Denton County Expo Center. So that's, that was done by the county commissioners. Uh, we're hoping to get uh, an Expo Center to create you know, more economic activity activity, more, more events within Denton County. Uh, so that one I think will be interesting. Uh, again, it's, it's, I don't think it'll have any real effects right at the short term, but it's going to provide the funding for a really great amenity for the county. Um, so that's our state legislation roundup. And with that, those are the things that are going on. It's been a kind of a busy quarter. Uh, be more than happy to ask, uh, answer any questions that I can. Um, Jim, is, uh, there's, a, there's a mic right behind you, bud. That way our friends in TV land can hear you. Okay. Is this on? Yeah. It is. All right. Uh, go back one slide. Okay. The second from the bottom, the TSTC, it says Denton Campus. I should have put Denton County. Okay. All right. I'll, I'll be, uh, let me be real blunt. Denton's got plenty of schools. City of. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So, so we, we, need it, we need it down here. All right. <laughs> but yeah, it's for Denton County. My apologies. Very good. Thank you. Yeah. Other questions? Please. Where's it? Thank you. Uh, in keeping, oh, good evening, Honorable Mayor and people. Um, I wanted to ask you, in keeping with this massage parlor stuff, we have, I want to know, I haven't done anything about it yet, okay? I, I like to go through the process, through the, you know. But this uh, condom sense that's out there, those places used to be where you couldn't find them. Mm -hmm. And this one's right there, 3040. Yep. I see that all the time. And of course, the, the campus, Harmon is not, 
it's it's not super close to it, but it is, you know. But that's a, what in the world? I mean, and I'm like, uh, can we do something about that? So. Um, Thank you. Yeah, no, great, great question. Um, so that that is an operating business, absolutely is allowed by right um, within the state of Texas. And so part of the challenge is, and it's not close, it, it meets all the rules and criteria. So you're right, it can't be too close to a school, those kinds of things. Uh, there also, it, it has to have you know, signage and whatnot that's appropriate. So really the only thing we can really do as far as, and, and my understanding is the owners actually worked with us on that as like window displays. We need to make sure the windows and displays are just not over the top. So we don't have a whole lot here. This is, this is the thing when you, when you, when you live in a, in a, in a state, in a country that provides a, a very capitalistic business oriented pro-business oriented world, there are all kinds of businesses that we may not all like or care for. We do everything we can as a city to make sure that those places are in appropriate locations um, and, and as, as moved as they can be. But you know, the other side of the coin of that conversation is you get a city that doesn't like churches. And so they go ahead and zone churches away. So unfortunately, if we want to have what we like, we also have to sometimes deal with the things that are not our favorite. Um, and so I know our police department works really hard with these types of businesses to make sure that they aren't a negative impact on crime and, and other issues. Um, so uh, that that I can assure you. Uh, but if you do see like it's it's flagrant displays, those kinds of things, we'd have to have a conversation. Um, I, I know years ago on 35 when we had uh, the bikini car washes and the bikini water slides and all of that stuff, you know, there was a lot of Louisville residents that thought, yeah, that's great. And there's a lot of Louisville residents that thought, no, that's horrible. Um, and so, you know, we had to go talk with those businesses and say, hey, can we can we find a way to to coexist. Um, so, so I wish I had a really good answer that was, would be, yeah, they're gone and we can get rid of them tomorrow. But if they're built and, and they follow in the rules, they're, they're absolutely allowed to be a business in Louisville and any other city in the state. I got a question. I drive up and down uh, Old Mill Street a lot and I just noticed a, a week or two ago of a mural that's in the alleyway is that a gay pride mural that goes down the sidewalk and stuff and is there any way we can get rid of that so so, so no it did i'm not really yeah. proud of it no it's it's it has i mean it's art it, it is art so if somebody wants to interpret that as god's rainbow to the end of the flood that's great if somebody wants to interpret that as gay pride that's fine it is a rainbow as far as it was designed to be. Um, so that art is actually on a private business wall. So the, the, all the critters on the wall, I don't know if you saw all those. Yeah, it's a pretty but, it's Yeah, a it's a marching band. Thing, yeah. it, it, was actually, it was actually modeled off of a picture, an old picture that's in City Hall of a bunch of Louisville residents at the train station. Um, uh -huh. And they all have little, if you look, they have little r ribbons because they were Louisville boosters at the time. Um, and so if you look at the wall, they're all sorts of, most of them are Texas native critters. There's a couple of odd ones. Um, but, you know, it's, it was, it's, yeah, and it's celebrating our marching band. It's celebrating all that stuff. And the rainbow is just a celebration and a happiness. If you want to ascribe something to it, like well, all art, you it can. Came, it just showed up about the Gay Pride Month. And I thought, yeah, the, actually, that well, that no, we don't that sidewalk has actually been in place for over a year. Uh, the, the crosswalk where the rainbow kind of comes out and into the crosswalk. Okay. So um, the mural itself is four or five years old now, but the the end of the crosswalk is part of our crosswalk right. program. And I that, just noticed that. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So you are you are like all good art. <laughs> I like it. Should art. it should inspire different thoughts. Yeah. So uh, that's that's what that one is. But it doesn't it uh, unless the artist has said something that I'm not aware of. Um, it, it wasn't really tacked to any particular motif other than it was bright and shiny and happy yeah well you got that <laughs> any other questions um i saw recently your um the article in uh the texas monthly from march about te uh, Louisville and lawns and encouraging native plants i was wondering if you could talk a little bit about um you know your encouragement of native plants in residential areas I'm all for it. Um, I'm all in. Um, so, and I think 
quite frankly, when we look at summers like we're having now and summers we had last year, it is a really easy way to help residents stay in their homes um, if we can change people's expectations and vision of what a great lawn looks like. Um, so you'll see this around the city. Uh-huh. Um, yes, uh, that, I have. And, and, and I like uh, it. I love our Parks Department for, for being uh, innovators in that regard. Um, there is an upfront cost to seating, and what we're actually finding is that the upfront cost to seating it is not as much as we thought. Um, th- these these native plants love dirt and they love growing out here. So, um, but we have to we're we're slowly moving mm-hmm. it out. So you're going to see most of that on Garden Ridge this year. Mm-hmm. Um, but we'll, we're moving out to other areas. You can see it down by Thrive um, and whatnot. But mm-hmm. the key here and and what I want people to understand is we live in a community, right? And so we we have these we have folks that love their European style structured lawn and they want to be able to golf on it and do all of that stuff. We have folks like me that are like. Uh, I, I, I want something pretty that's low maintenance. How do yes. I figure that out? Uh, and, and everything in between. And, and we, we have to be good neighbors. So mm-hmm. what we don't want is for somebody to just not take care of their lawn, not mow it, and go, native habitat. You know, when it's just full of weeds. Um, We want it to be a structured, intentional space. Um, And so we have a program for that. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't know when the next one is, um, but uh, sign up for the city newsletters. Go to the city website and find that. Um, And you can get certified. And basically what it says is for three years, you are certified to to do this. We inspect the lawn and make sure that it has a certain percentage of of natives and, and all of that good stuff. But... It's designed to get you educated, number one. Mm -hmm. And number two, make sure that you're putting it in in, in place in a way that um, isn't just off kilter, just not taking care of. That's where I'm going is how do you then, uh, if you're trying to plant more native plants, how do you avoid running foul of code enforcement? Right. And so that's why the certification process. So the the certified lawns have the ability, um, the code knows who they are. And you'll get a little little sticker and uh, fence post too that you put in. You can put in your lawn to, to let people know. Um, so we rolled it out this spring, mm-hmm. um, and I don't know when the next one will be, but I'm sure it's coming up. Um, because quite frankly, the Native Plant Society of Texas is excited about the opportunity. So we've got remember. all sorts of folks. And quite frankly, the only way that we're going to get this to really take off is when my, my neighbor does it, and then I walk over and go, you know, that looks pretty cool. Can you show me? And then it grows in the neighborhood organically that way because uh, we're not going to we're not going to force people to change that's not Certainly. that's not what this is about but the code enforcement people are aware that y'all are encouraging this sort of thing they absolutely are involved in the process they were involved in designing the program so okay. that they knew how that would work but again you've got it you've got to be certified so you have to go through the city training to do it uh-huh. um, and once you do that then yeah you'll you'll be on the list and code enforcement won't have an issue with we you we just got cited for having too many sunflowers but you're not you don't have a certified one yet right no but it's you just started it so right. how could we have gotten certified that's right so that's that, that's how we're moving into that mm-hmm. so so i i get i get the having tall stuff i would you know me personally uh make sure it's like in a garden looks mm-hmm. like it's in a garden and that may help but i don't know all the rules on the on the code side so okay. I, I listen Code enforcement's put stickers on my wall, too. It happens. It happens to all of us. It absolutely happens to me while I've been mayor. So, okay, um, don't, don't. Okay, because I read the article and it seemed that you were encouraging this and then I'm getting in trouble for it. So so we're we're encouraging it, but we have, it has to start from a place of education and Uh certification. We can't just do it and then backfill. That's, Mm -hmm. that's the goal. So. So that's that's why that's why there's a little bit of confusion. But I appreciate the interest. I really do, and I and I understand that we got kind of little. There's a little bit of as thing. Whenever a new program starts, there's kind of this give and take that has to happen. Mm-hmm. Um, so no, I appreciate you. I appreciate your input, and I'm sure our team will be taking taking some notes of this and seeing how we can smooth that out over time. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. What soil sterilization on Garden Ridge there? Oh, so yeah, so that is, um, you want to kill off all the weeds that are underneath, all the non-natives, and so you're using heat to, um, to kill off 
basically it, it creates this thermal blanket and there's no light and it's hot so you basically are cooking all the seeds that are in the soil so that they can't germinate and then when you go in and put in the new seeds um, they're all they're not going to have to fight as hard uh, to take over the space and that'll be the natural plant and that'll be the natural plants that's correct so all garden ridge eventually be on that a vast majority of garden ridge will have that yes okay do you get like ticks do the grasses grow a little bit high do you get problems with ticks and stuff like that like you're doing you know i don't know but my my guess is while there may be more of them that's also more food for birds <laughs> and and so I'm I'm of the opinion that if we can turn we're on we're on a major flyway for hundreds of species of birds that migrate up and up and down the United States. Um, if you go to Thrive, you'll notice a lot of the art is birds because of that. Um, my goal, if we do this right, is we become Bucky's for birds. <laughs> Yeah, and we just, the birds love us and they hang out here and we become a bird, bird watcher's heaven and, and we get tourism dollars for it and all that good stuff. So yeah, I'm, I'm okay with a few extra. Uh, again, the, the plants are growing up a little higher, um, so people probably aren't gonna be walking in it and we will mow borders around them. So it's still useful as park space and, and it won't be like up on the sidewalks. Yeah, so it won't, it won't be right up on the sidewalk. So you can, because again, we have to keep those sidewalks ADA compliant. So we can't have a bunch of shrubbery and brush like encroaching on the space. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Um, in keeping, okay, I wanted to just tell you, I'm not against parks. I mean, I think it's wonderful that you're building these parks, uh, like the Gloria Park that's being built. But my question to you is, are we taking any money away from the city infrastructure because our city needs a lot of infrastructure repair you know the stop signs you can't hardly even read what the stop signs you know the paint they need to be painted and that's not even the the streets that i travel on you know they need whether they're the main streets or whether they're in neighborhoods they need to repair so my question is well that's great but you know, are we taking any money away from that, the, the city infrastructure? Sure. That's, that's my question, sure. thank you. So we have multiple things we have to pay for. And, and when, you, when we frame it like that, that one department is taking money from another, I can make the exact same framing that our fire and police are taking away from infrastructure. I can make that exact same argument for any department that I personally don't care for. Um, so I would say that's a dangerous conversation to have uh, because parks are part of our infrastructure. People use our parks and our trails to get to work. They use it to get home from school. So they don't have to have a car. So there's a need for these parks for other reasons maybe not as, as visible as a road. Um, as visible as a sign, but I can tell you we have plenty of money. If there's a stop sign that you can't read, that's that's faded out or something like that, you can absolutely call the city and tell them, hey, I need this 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 stop sign. Again, we run really lean, we run a really tight ship. So the more our Louisville residents can tell us, hey, there's a pothole here, there's there's a stop sign that's busted over here, there's a pipe that's not working, and understand, staff may have already gotten that information. It just takes time. Like for example, there's a there's a busted um, light pole down on I think 3040, and it's been there for a little while. Uh, but there's an insurance issue that has to get taken care of that always happens when people run into those. So you have to figure out who's paying for the thing, and that takes time. Then you have to make sure the thing's in stock from the vendor. So where is that? Where is that? It may take a month or two if it's if it's available. And then you got to schedule your staff to get in there and put it in. So things take time. Um, so, but but we absolutely, if there's something that you you see a road or a, a, a street sign or something that you feel is not being taken care of. Absolutely, call the city, use the Our Louisville app, and we'll take care of it. We'll get it handled, if it, especially if it's a, a, something like a stop sign that people can't read. That's life safety. That's a done deal. So, so I, would, I, I, would, I, would, I would challenge the, the mindset of, are we taking money? Yeah, we absolutely are. We're taking money all the time from one thing to another because it's a bucket of money. And so how do we pay for things that are important? And you know, I've got 132,000 different opinions on what's important and what's not. Um, and so we have, to, we have to balance that all out and make sure it works well. Um, so the feedback I've gotten from most residents is that we seem to be doing a really good job. If you have a difference of opinion on that, I'm absolutely happy to hear it, happy to talk with you about it and find other ways to maybe achieve the same goals or, or even different goals if it's, if it's out of line. Um, but that, I hope that answers your question. Yes, thank you. But I didn't, I didn't mean, um, I don't 
I, oh, I no, I understand. I absolutely understand. You didn't mean to pick on. No, um, I didn't mean. Um, how do I say it? I didn't mean to minimize the parks. Please understand that. I, I just, I just uh, when there's uh, like potholes that mm -hmm. you know your car is practically sinking in you know i'm exaggerating a little bit uh, sure, but you sure, know sure. what i'm saying okay? i do i do so i don't want you to think i mean i used to substitute teach i love the kids i love the children so i know it's important for them to have a place a safe place yep. where they can play and everything please you know i want you to know my heart so i don't want you to think for one second no you know the park is not important to right. me of course it is but um but when there's potholes mm -hmm. that are you know, on safe on streets and your cars. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, absolutely. It, we it's, absolutely it's a, it's have a that. danger. Yeah. But I just wanted to clarify that with yeah. you because I didn't want to leave that impression no. with you. Okay? No, not at all. You didn't leave it with me. <laughs> uh, I, just a side note. Sometimes those potholes are on streets we don't control. So a lot of folks will say, well, why, why is, you know, why is uh, uh, there's a 3040? Well, 3040 is not technically ours. That's the state's. And so if I start filling potholes, guess what? The state's going to tell me, you own the whole road. And now i got to pay for all of it. So no, not going to do that. I'm going to make sure that the state does what they're supposed to do, and we're going to take care of the roads that we take care of. 3040 is a, is a, state, a state road. A state road? Yeah. Well, okay. 121. I-35, uh, all of those well, big no, roads. Well, no, I yeah. knew I-35, yeah, but I, I didn't I, know 3040. I, yeah, I get, a lot of com I get a lot of feedback on like 121. People forget that that's a state road. So, But I, I absolutely understand your point. So, okay, I, yeah. I just yeah. didn't want to leave no, you with that no, impression. No, you, you, you know, you I love not. the children. Yeah. And so, okay. Awesome. Thank you. I think we got time for one more. Jim? Yeah. Now, this is not a question, but a comment, a good comment. Uh, the uh, site, our Louisville TX, I believe that's just an app, yeah. but I have used it three times recently because I really didn't know about it until recently but when you go to that site at the very bottom then uh, at the second page at the very bottom it says request and you can put a request in now I think they, ha they list list all the departments and you can choose if you can find the right department otherwise you just put other and I've used it three times and I mean bam the next day it was my issue was taken care of by the city so i mean there's not a big crowd here right now but for those of you that are here that's a fantastic site it's our louisville tx it is an app yeah it's so not, just yeah go to your app, go to your app store so android or, or google go to your app store and just type in the search field type our louisville tx, TX. And if you do that, you're going to get an app that comes up. What's great about the app is, yeah, yeah, I mean, you can get really granular. I can give the GPS position of that pothole. I absolutely can. I can take pictures of my neighbor that's not conforming to code enforcement, send it on. I can do all that. I can, I can, I can put them in anonymously. It's all there. But at the end of the day, you can just go to the bottom of the page and go, I have no idea. Somebody fix this. And because it's now in a database, it's trackable. And our city staff goes and looks at that and goes, this hasn't been handled. Has anybody addressed this? And so it's a trackable, and you can see it on the board where I, I actually had a picture of one. Um, so it's actually a lot better than calling because if you call, you leave a voicemail, somebody forgets to write it down, somebody forgets to follow it. It, it just, it's not in a database. Um, so I would absolutely encourage you and your, your friends and family get after that. If you wanna be, uh, if you wanna be involved and, and help, help your city do better, it's a great tool for that. Thanks, Jim. Appreciate the feedback. Well, with that, folks, I hope you had a great evening. Uh, for those in TV land, for those who are here, I'm going to be sticking around for a few more minutes, but um, I'm always happy to answer questions, and, and I hope you found this useful. Uh, it'll be recorded and put up on the city's YouTube page, and there'll be a link to it here in, in not too distant future, a couple of days. Um, and so you can share it with your friends and family. Uh, and again, I'm always available. Your city council is always available. Just reach out. We'd love to, love to have a dialogue with you um, if you've got questions or concerns or, or ways to make the city better. 